webinar session. It's titled COVID-19 in Africa, Business Risk and Mitigation Strategies. Let me start by saying that Africa has a very weak health sector. And with the rising population of about 1.3 million people, our continent faces enormous health and economic challenges with increasing COVID-19 spread. It started in China in January 2020, entered Africa early February in Egypt. But as of today, we have about 22,000 confirmed cases, about 1,120 deaths, and about 5,482 recoveries spread across 52 African countries. It is primarily a health challenge, but the nature of COVID-19, particularly the rate of and mode of spread, clearly demonstrate that it's far more than just a health challenge. It is complex with far-reaching negative socioeconomic impacts and risk on both global and African economies. In a bid to contain it, Africa and other parts of the world are more or less in lockdown. And this has brought about immense socioeconomic challenges, health problems, everything seems to be on lockdown, agriculture, transport, logistics, aviation, almost all sectors are affected. Based on this, we believe that Africa, with all its initial challenges, will face more problems. It's a continent where about one third of its population, about 42 million, live below poverty line. And that means that the challenge of COVID-19 will be enormous. And IMF reckons that we might need about $114 billion to address COVID-19 challenges in 2020. About 20 million formal jobs and 250 million formal jobs will be attributed. The contraction will be about 5.1%. And in terms of output loss, we are looking at about 37 to $79 billion. And McKinsey reports that we might lose between 9 to 7 billion. So based on this, we might likely experience the first recession. And that means that impacts on household is severe, is dramatic, and welfare losses will be about 7% using the best case scenario. At a, on the same time, FDI will decline, foreign portfolio investment, consumption expenditure, manufactured goods, utilities, transport, energy, all of them will experience significant decline. And of course, there will be massive capital flight. Based on these challenges, we believe and we think that African businesses will be facing so many different types of challenges. And that's why we thought it necessary and important to share ideas and to have a webinar so that our businesses will learn some of these challenges and also understand the best strategies to use to address it. So I welcome all of you that have joined us and we have a panel session that will be joining me to address and discuss this. Before I introduce the panel members, let me explain a few, few rules that we're going to use. So if you look below the screen, you will see a, a, where we have question and answers. So I can see many people using the chat message. So once you um, have questions that you want us to answer, please use the question and answers session. Normally, what we are looking at to do is that after the first session, after the first set of questions to the panel members, we will now uh, answer some questions from the participants, and we'll take another round of questions, and we'll come back to the participants to answer the questions. So let me first of all start by introducing our panel members. So we have Professor Enase Okonodo, who is the Dean of Lagos Business School, and also Professor of Accounting. Can I see? Can you say uh, hello to the participants? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We also have Professor Chris Obeche, Professor of Strategic Management and Director, Lagos Business School Sustainability Center. Professor Chris, are you there? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. I also have Dr. Herenta Onwe Buzia, who is the Director of Manager School. And senior lecturer at entrepreneurship at Swedish Lagos Business School. Aretha, are you there? Yes, please. Hello, everyone. Yeah. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Oke Muki, who is the Deputy Managing Director of Coach Charis, as well as a senior fellow at Lagos Business School. 
He's also on board of Access Bank. He's the chair of Credit and Finance Committee and also a member of the Risk Committee of Access Bank. Dr. Nguke, can you say hello to everybody? Hello, good afternoon. Okay. With this, I say again, welcome. As I said, what we're going to do is to take the first set of questions. And I will be posing these questions to the panel members. Before I do that, let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Franklin Ingo. I'm an economist and associate professor teaching strategy and risk management at Lagos Business School. So based on this, let me start with the first question, which we go to Professor Kennedy. Let's say that with COVID-19, our VUCA environment will be more VUCA. Outside the known risk, such as credit, market, operational regulatory, what new risk do you think African businesses and economies will face going forward into COVID-19? Um, thank you very much, uh, Franklin. Indeed, in your introduction, you painted a not so rosy picture, and I think that a number of the risks that, or the challenges that African businesses face right now, you have uh, rightly identified. Um, an environment such as ours that has um, characteristically, over the past decade or more, has been um, characterized as VUCA, meaning it is volatile, it is uncertain, it is chaotic, it is ambiguous. We have always operated. However, COVID-19 has brought on challenges which we never anticipated. And in addition to the risks which we always anticipate and plan for, I think that there are a few other risks that are a consequence, or if you like, a more direct consequence of this COVID-19 situation. The first I'd like to speak about is the economic risk. When we talk about economic risk, we're looking at uh, the chances that macroeconomic conditions uh, will change. Therefore, we're looking at such things as exchange rates, we're looking at government uh, regulation, perhaps in some parts we're talking about the political uh, situation as well, inflation, all those things that are really the macroeconomic indicators. And we find that with the advent of uh, COVID-19, these things are even uh, further um, heightened, these risks are further heightened. Let's take, for instance, the exchange rates there. You know, in Nigeria, talking about the peculiarities of Nigeria, in which we find that our, the major source, I think all of us know the major source of our revenues are oil revenues. Now, on account of the geopolitical situation, as well as the consequence of COVID-19 and a downturn in global consumption, two things are affecting our uh, pricing of oil. One is that we find that there's reduced demand for our oil. Now, all of those, mean that if there's reduced demands, we've seen it translated into this oil prices per barrel that has gone to below 20. Obviously, with a number of companies, this is going to be of grave consequence. Because if as a nation, our, our revenues are highly in decline, government spending is in decline. What is available from government spending is in decline there. What is the consequence for uh, companies? Of course, we anticipate inflation. And I guess that all of us are starting to see that across uh, various um, items. Now, the disruption of the global supply chain, obviously, because of the huge dependence of the world on China, also has a consequence for the related economies. Indeed, you know, just reflecting on it, I found it very interesting that for years now in business school, we have been touting and talking about globalization. And in the run-up to this, we have seen a few nations just sort of wanting to adopt populist and nationalist, and I think that those sort of things have been brought to the fore even now. We also face, if you like, um, risks that come about on, on account of the political situation. So with political risks, we find that businesses could be impacted by political decisions or decisions that the government makes with respect to any number of things. The decisions that they make with respect to taxes at a point at which productivity is low for a number of companies there, um, expected sales and revenues are being threatened, what happens? On account of the currency uh, values, which I have alluded to earlier on, trade tariffs and labor laws there. So these are a few of the things that I find that you know, have to be given a bit more consideration in these COVID times than uh, prior to this by um, organizations there. Obviously, their impact, more of an impact on specific sectors. But as time goes on, I suppose that we'll be discussing those. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kennedy. And you said that I painted a gloomy picture, but I think you helped me to paint a more, 
I think you've uh, expanded on some of these challenges. And I'm sure participants will not be feeling that oh, we are finished, actually. But we are not finished. But let me go to the uh, second question by looking at uh, this. We go to Professor Obetia. Uh, focusing on non risk, credit credit, operational, and the risk that uh, Professor Kennedy has uh, uh, mentioned and identified. Do you think that their impacts or the way they manifest, for example, in firm operations, will change with COVID-19? And is a new understanding and approach to risk management required? Means that market conditions are changing rapidly. If market conditions change rapidly, it has impact on market risk. Because market positions are changing, demand is shrinking, and there's a need for a better understanding of your customers and how this COVID-19 is impacting on them. Because it will lead to the next risk, which will also grow, and that is credit risk. Can my customers be able to pay? And if we don't understand that credit risk, then the tendency of having high level of debt will also come in. Operational risk will also increase. You can imagine all of us are now on online. Companies who are operating will now realize there's a risk of the internet providers being overloaded to the extent that many of us could just shut down because of that risk of limited supply of internet facility. But one of the other risks that is important that is actually going to grow is reputational risk. Because some companies might think it's an opportunity for them to make quick buck. But socially responsible companies are conscious of the fact that if they misbehave, it could damage their reputation going forward. What they do now could even have impact on how they are perceived at the end of at post COVID-19. So it's important that at this stage, we become socially responsible. But another risk that has come up to the fore is people's risk. COVID-19 is a health issue. How many of my key people could, form, could become victims of COVID-19? And that means we might lose a talent or find it difficult to even get key talents at the end of COVID-19. The other issue, other risk that is going to manifest in almost during this period is compliance risk. Because as government is going to pump in some money to help cushion the effect, there'll be more scrutiny on companies. And that scrutiny means that whatever we do that will go against regulation and legal conditions could lead to higher risk for us. So at this stage, I think that some of the, all this risk will increase because they're going to be associated with mismanagement, customer and supply consolidation take place, credit defaults are likely to happen, regulators are going to be on our back, but most important, it will be difficult to even forecast either cash flow or sales. So we'll talk more about some of this risk as we go forward. Thank you very much, Professor Wetcher. And from what I hear you say, you're more or less emphasizing that operational risk will definitely manifest in different forms. And that takes me to the third question, which we go to Dr. Mook. And you know, previously, or even currently, people normally believe that operational risk is the fulcrum upon which other types of risk will be effectively managed. And of course, operational risk is caused by people, processes, systems, and external events. So given that COVID-19 can be argued to be an external factor, do you think that people will remain the greater liability and asset in management of operational risk and other risk by the firm? And if yes, do you think that people's risk will expand or reduce in African economies with COVID-19 and how? Um, thank you, um, Dr. Franklin. Now, the Professor Gretchen has um, mentioned the fact that uh, people's risk will be a major, um, will be packed heavily in the course of this uh, COVID-19. 
Um, he alluded to the fact that we're all online today. Um, sometimes either you are on a generator before you know it, you are no longer connected, or provider goes up, etc. So these are little things that typically you don't, you know, um, you are not used to as an organization. However, for whether organization, whether people become an asset or a liability to an organization is a function of, I would say, many things. You know, a, a major part of that is how, what is the people culture? How is the organization managed? Um, a lot of organizations, you know, take uh, people decisions, something can farm out to some low level HR person, you know, higher and that's the end. However, given the importance of people to an organization, I mean, that fact has been, cannot be um, further portrayed, portrayed than what is happening today. Organizations, everybody you know today is working on other response uh, structures, contingency plans to stabilize the business. All of that requires human beings. Meanwhile, as we speak, a lot of uh, cities, countries, and businesses are shut down. So those human beings are not in the physical location. So first of all, even getting them to do the job and doing it right from their remote locations is the major challenge. So one would say that has also increased the people's risk. However, we also realize that um, at the time of crisis, uh, organizations are struggling with uh, revenue losses, either actual or potential. And the implication of that is also they have to do something to the people. Either um, there'll be chances of um, salaries being affected or the presented paid or not paid. And it might even lead to loss of um, jobs. So uncertainty is high at the same time. And we also know that when the problem of uncertainty is high in an environment with the people, that will likely increase in a fraud. People try to more or less pay themselves salaries if organization cannot pay them in a negative sense. Now, but for this, for people to be an asset and organization, like I said, require that the culture from day one, not just at the crisis time, supports um, um, the risk management framework of the organization. I've worked in an organization where from day one, as you're joining, you're, you know your career path, the culture is known, policies are set out. Not that uh, you have a meeting at uh, 10 o'clock, the, the chairman or the founder can come at um, 11. No, that's not right. In fact, the chairman or the founder, that in that case, to be the first person to resume. So if you are late by a minute, you are not in the meeting. So we know clearly that people decisions were taken from a strategic standpoint to align with the vision, mission, and objective of the organization. In cases of difficulties and challenges, that culture becomes an asset. That is, in that point, people have become an asset to the organization. Now, if you have a bad culture in an organization, people actually become a liability. Um, in my time as an executive in the bank, when we decide to hire, we look at the culture of the organization, we decide to try the organization where to hire from and where not to hire from. But what we are looking for, the attributes of that organization that support the character of the organization we are building. So the first decision is, who are we hire, which are we, where are we hiring from? What attributes will people from that organization bring to bear and to support what we are doing? If the culture of that organization we think does not support what we are doing, we not, even if the best candidate comes from that culture, we will not hire that person. Now, all we are trying to do is to ensure that decisions on people starting from recruitment through the entire career path, or the, what you call credit to grave, is a major decision. Most time, for most responsible organizations, the job of the CEO, even if somebody helping the CEO do that, the decision, ultimate decision, rest with the CEO. Now, like I said, the employees must reflect the character of the organization you're building. The culture of an organization will serve as the first line of defense from a risk management standpoint. If the culture supports the risk uh, management um, the strategy of the organization. Otherwise, you have a culture that where nobody cares, anybody goes, or where everything goes rather, it means that the human beings will actually become a liability rather than asset. So the, the point here is, at crisis times, is the culture at all times that helps you to weed out, you know, the wrong recruits. The culture has served usually as um, antibodies, in the, like in the human body, to ensure that any wrong recruit, even if he goes through the recruitment process, the culture takes him or her out because that person cannot succeed or be supported by the culture. So basically, when you have a good a set of good people supported by a positive culture, you can say that you truly have a, a first line of defense in your risk management framework, which is the people. 
in that case, the people have become an asset. So basically, I think we'll be talking about a lot more of this as we go on, but whether your people are your assets or liabilities effectively depends on how and the culture you have created as a leader. That leader must walk the talk. You know that you create policies and you can, you know, um, take on decisions when it comes to difficult things for you uh, coming from you. I think maybe you can talk about this as we go on in a subsequent question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Muke. So what I hear you say is that people, even with COVID-19, people still remain the major assets that organizations will use to effectively manage their different types of risk, including COVID-19. And that brings me to the fourth question that goes to Dr. Omwe Buzia. Looking at what, based on the introduction, we are saying that the COVID-19 affect, is affecting almost every sector of the economy in Africa, from transport to logistics, agriculture to financial, financial to even home services, even from home services to manufacturing, all sectors. So the question is, do you think that impact, uh, in terms of the sectors, which one do you think will be more impacted and which one do you think will be less impacted. And secondly, will the impact be the same for African multinationals and SMEs? How and why? All right, thank you, Franklin. So every industry is definitely going to be affected. It's just that some will be affected negatively and others will be affected positively. But even those that will be affected negatively can, with some level of innovation, find ways to survive. So for instance, um, the industries that have been negatively affected, impacted uh, at first um, are the airline industry and related businesses like travel agents, hotels. We have ent the entertainment industry, live shows can't be held anymore and you can't have music festivals. The movie theaters can't have um, people com coming to watch movies. Sporting events obviously can't hold because you can't have people playing without social distancing or a large crowd in the stadium. Um, the fast food outlets as we know them too, today can't operate, the flower industry, beauty parlors, um, beauty salons, or even barbing salons, you know, event planners who you know, normally plan big weddings and parties, birthday parties, um, schools are all shut down and school related activities. So people who um, sell the books that children buy or the snack shops around, okay, of course, tailoring, I mean, nobody's doing anything, nobody's going out to any parties, so nobody's sewing clothes. So all these industries have been Negatively, negatively affected on the face of it. But as I explained before, with a bit of imagination, so for instance, in Kenya, many passenger airlines are now um, converting to cargo airlines and they're taking things from Kenya, from Nairobi to, to, to London. Um, travel agents, you can say, what can they do? They can begin to offer virtual reality experiences of different um, countries. Um, hotels have obviously no customers right now. And I was thinking that they could actually become shelters for doctors and nurses who are risking their lives and actually risking their families' lives when they go home to their nearest and dearest. So maybe hotels can be, um, can be used as shelters for these doctors from Monday to Friday or they can, so that they go home minimally and minimize the risk. Um, there's also been an increase in domestic violence as reported by the newspapers, um, which means that the women are locked in with their aggressors. So maybe these women who need to be relocated can also be taken to these hotels and in turn maybe act as the cleaners who have been laid off at the moment you know so that the hotels can function with these people as cleaners um with regards to the movie theaters um we can, the driving theaters that you can actually uh, where you can have a big screen outside and the people watch from their cars um, fast food outlets obviously won't have working customers but could be the centers that provide the food prepared for as palliatives to the more, more vulnerable population. So just, just, these are just a few examples of um, ways businesses can be reshaped to key into the new economy. Now, the sectors that have been, that are booming now because um, the COVID favors them in a sense are first agriculture. We can't stop producing food, otherwise we transit to um, having a food crisis or famine. So, and indeed agriculture even needs to spike further because most countries are introducing restrictions on exports because they want to conserve what they have for their citizens given that production has gone down. So African countries will need to spike their production because they can't import as much food as they used to um, before. Logistics definitely is booming. I mean, we know that Amazon recently included, uh, recruited 100,000 and has just 
recruited another um, 100,000. So about 200 people have been recruited by Amazon in just a month, within a month or so. So it's obvious, and even in Nigeria, we have companies like Farm Crowdy, Cobalt 360, who have and GIGM, whose logistics services are, are, are booming right now because of the need to move goods and services from one essential goods and services from one location to another. Medical services, be obvious, because this is where the patients are going to. And of course, manufacturers of medical equipment and then cleaning materials like sanitizers, etc. Now, the other sector that can actually boom, if we think well, is the construction industry. Africa, well, let me use Nigeria, for example, has a lot of areas where we can begin construction. All our markets from mile 12 to Dumata to Balogu to um, all these places have been very shabby for decades. This is a huge opportunity for government to give build operator and transfer contracts to architects and construction companies to restructure these um, markets so that in that way they also create employment for the restive area boys who have been going around, you know, and springing up riots and threatening to attack homes because they don't have any livelihood. Now, this is one way we can begin to create a new economy that will ensure that we emerge post-COVID with a stronger um, society. Um, you asked me about the multinationals and the SMEs. So everybody's going to be affected, but obviously the SMEs are more vulnerable because multinationals have deeper pockets and therefore can withstand this a little bit longer. So for SMEs, I would say the knee-jerk reaction of laying people off may not necessarily help you survive. You have to also begin to think what you should do differently to key to the new economy. Great. I'll stop here for now. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Nwe Buzie, and thank you to other panelists. Now, uh, based on what you've, we've uh, discussed, I, I think it might be helpful for us to take a um, few questions from the participants. And from what I've seen, we already have 77 questions, so which is very interesting, but it's also a risk that we might not be able to answer all of them. So what we'll do is I will take a few of the questions in a random way and, and uh, um, pose it to the panelists to, be, to answer. So let me start by saying that one of the questions says that um, with increased move to virtual business models, electronic payments and e-commerce. What are your thoughts on the resilience of Nigerian business, especially banks and e-commerce platform in the light of the lockdown necessitated by COVID-19 and increased likelihood that we may see more issues with global warming and pandemics? It follows with, is there enough attention paid to business continuity and disaster recovery planning and maintenance of these plans? So let me, the first question in terms of with regards to the increase in virtual business, electronic payments, and e-commerce, what are your thoughts on the resilience of Nigerian financial institutions? Let me ask Professor Nasser Kennedy to share her thoughts on this. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think that that question is very apt, not only with respect to financial institutions, but indeed to all organizations, given what we have seen with um, a lot more organizations um, moving to working remotely. I will come to addressing the Nigerian financial institutions and the resilience there. But I think that we must not be unmindful, regardless of whether we work in the financial services sector or not, about the risk that faces us now that uh, we are working remotely. Uh, businesses are always under constant cyber threats. Now, that has been increased on account of what it is that is going on now. And what has happened is that, you know, we saw the first level response of most organizations in anticipation of the lockdown or perhaps when there was still a restriction on movement. What we saw was that the first level response of some organizations was making plans uh, for people to work offline, to work remotely there. I am not so sure how many of us across the respective organizations were fully able to put those in place until there was a complete lockdown. And therefore companies were um, a number of companies found themselves grappling to see how they can adapt to the changes that we see. Now, this has led to the cyber criminals, if I may, taking advantage to be able to see the ways by which they can um, access this for any number of things. So there has been an increase of a number of things, it, not only in terms of malicious uh, sites, but then business email compromise, even compromises for the kind of tools that we use and the various platforms that we're using uh, for meetings now. 
And then others that we have seen happening is that perhaps there's been theft, uh, data theft, and indeed we have seen inst instances of data theft for extortion and for any number of uh, things, including ransomware um, attacks. I think that the first stage in man, and then perhaps just to briefly speak about the resilience of uh, banks. In my view, the financial institutions were perhaps better able to cope with this because over the last, uh, the recent past, there has been a, an increased um, attention by financial institutions brought on by the regulators for cybercrime. And therefore, they have said, you know what, this is a major thing that assails financial institutions all over the world, particularly in Nigeria. What are we doing in this regard? So therefore, I feel that financial institutions may have had a head start on the other sectors in order to put in place the measures that are necessary in order to combat any cyber threats. But there are a couple of points I want to make on account of uh, what should be the approach of companies in terms of dealing with it. The first thing that we need to keep in mind is that any risk management approach has to come from the top, which means that we need board level uh, commitments to ensuring that uh, robust risk management practices are in place. That's the first. The second is that I believe that even as we scramble to say, let's adapt to working online also, that must support the business goals of the organization. Any risk management uh, approach must align with the business goals of this organization, which means that we cannot afford to take the risk management of technology brought about by technology as if you like a domain specific or a siloed approach there. We must look at it across all other areas of the business. In other words, for business continuity, what are the things that we're going to do? How are we going to manage risk across board there? And perhaps adopt what we may know as an enterprise uh, risk management approach that is integrated uh, this. The third is with the correct identification of what tools you are going to use. Now, in several instances, we find that the threats come about because of a failure of a lack of a robust process in place for managing it. Yes, there are many tools that can be employed to guard against unauthorized entry of people into your place to safeguard the security of your data and so on and so forth. But we must not misunderstand, we must not, um, if you like, underestimate the people factor in things there. Whereas before now, a number of organizations probably had things as to the data that you could copy and use now. Now we're assessing those data remotely. What happens in the in-between there? How do we assure the security of the various individuals that work within those organizations? Little things like just someone peeping over your shoulder, as an example, or perhaps the data being corrupted as well there. So in order for us to have, uh, to increase our resilience to risk management there, it must start from the top. We must align the risk management goals with the business goals of the organization. We must identify and analyze what the right tools with specific metrics are to do that there. And basically this just involves the institution of a robust framework that takes into account the integrated approach. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kenneth. Let me, uh, the second question is from Abdul Malik Fad. And he says, in broad sense, and this goes to Dr. Nwebuzia, he says, in broad sense, what is, your, what is our new normal going to look like post coronavirus for the Nigerian economy and SMEs in terms of continuity? All right, so the first thing to understand is that we're in a marathon and not a sprint. Um, historical research has shown that it takes between 500 to 800 days to the pandemic to run through. To run through. So it means an average of two years. So anybody looking at this thing that will end maybe when the Nigerian lockdown ends on the 27th of this month or maybe next month is in for a big surprise. Okay, so this is actually the new normal. It's going to be on for a while. And I don't think business as usual is ever going to come back. Uh, business as we know is ever going to come back. So I think that what the way forward for SMEs or multinationals is to begin to ask yourself how we can key into the new economy because some opportunities are going off, others are coming up. Okay, um, we just spoke about logistics and how Amazon has employed 100,000 people. For supermarkets and markets to continue to thrive, they need to key into the digital world so that people can order online and the goods are delivered to them. So, um, and there are many other, so even for tailors, okay, so now there'll be less demand for fashion clothing as most people are going to be, need to be celebrating at the social distance. So for example, it was a, it's a friend's um, 
husband's birthday and they're getting messages from the family's friends recorded and played um, my husband. So, and then that, I also saw a party where the man was standing in front of his house and people, friends and family drove through wishing him well. I, I'm not sure whether they give out packs of um, goodies, goodies, but life is different, okay? So I think that the way forward is be to ask yourself how one can be relevant in this new economy. So if I'm a tailor, can I begin to make more face masks? Begin to make uniforms for the volunteers who are becoming health workers? Begin to make, you know, PPEs. Our, our bad brothers are already doing that. You know, and in Ghana, they're already producing their own face masks, their own PPEs, and all the medical equipment that are required for this um, as are required for this period. So this is the new economy. Solve a problem, and you'll be able to thrive, survive, and thrive. Okay. So what worked yesterday will no longer work in some instances. Of course, logistics have always done multiple goods and services, and that is continuing to be relevant. But if you were in the, I don't know, beauty parlor industry, for example, it's going to be very difficult for people to walk through your door now for a haircut or for a hairdo. So you have to begin to think about ways of having your own channel on YouTube or whatever, where you teach people to do these things on their own. So this is my take. That. Thank you very much. And this brings me to, I was just going through the questions and somebody uh, posted and said that the, the new normal is to accept that abnormal is the new normal. Mm -hmm. So and that's, and so I manage this abnormal that is a new normal. And that person says that you need to know the kind of talents that you recruit into your organization as in terms of your employees. So this brings me to the question which we go to Professor Obechi. In a survey of the level of risk awareness and practice in African firms, and using ranking of one to five with five with one the lowest and five the highest. African employees on average scored about 1.5. With emerging risk due to COVID-19, what should African businesses do differently to improve the level of risk awareness and practice across African firms? Thank you, Franklin. That survey result is not a surprise for the simple reason that many African com companies have not embedded the right risk culture. They have not driven it down from top to bottom. Many of them think that risk is only handled at the very senior management level. So the risk, the first thing that companies have to do now is to understand that first and foremost, their business models will change. It's not business as usual. Business model will change and as such, different risks will emerge. Think supermarket chain, for example. With the new normal, neighborhood stores will be the, will be the, will be the, will be the future in addition to online. And that means they are going to have different risk to look at. Risk of supply chain, risk of theft, risk of getting the right employees. But in order to ensure that this risk culture is permeated within the whole organization, then they have to integrate it into day-to-day -day lives of all employees. Whatever decision people take at different levels, they must think of, they must look at it from a risk perspective. But there's also a danger, I want to warn, that in integrating it amongst all employees, we should not inhibit innovation because the only way to get out of this new normal and succeed in it is innovation. We must innovate in order to grow. And innovation also brings its own some different risk. How can we as organizations increase that? And as I has already mentioned something that is critical, and that is that risk reporting to the board and senior management should be a priority. So right at the board level, they must have a big picture of the entire risk that the, com that the company is going through. So we must, at this stage, try and ensure that every person within the organization understand what risk is all about. And that means we have to give every staff every employee the necessary skills and tools to identify 
manage and mitigate risk at their own level. Because risk is not only at the top, even at the lowest level. Take, for example, drivers. With logistics being key, because we are now moving on to online, you find that the level the, that the kind of drivers and the training given to them will change. Because a driver at this stage will be managing an asset that is worth over 30 million naira. That is the cost of a big trailer. And yet, if we employ illiterate drivers and ask them to manage this kind of assets, that's a big risk. So for them, at that level, they should understand what it is to have breakdowns, to deliver late, and implication to the business. So my message for African countries is that we need to develop the right risk culture, drive it down to the lowest level, give all the employees the necessary skills and tools to be able to identify, manage, mitigate risk at their own different level. And risk management and culture should be embedded in decision making at all levels. If we do that, we will now be moving into the new world where risk should not be a key thing in all strategies that we develop. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Boetje. This, um, your explanations leads to the question that is for Dr. Okem Muki. Somebody is asking that he has money to invest and he was already planning to start investment before this COVID-19 started. And he was, of course, he was, he's, he's planning to do, make this investment with the hope of getting a return on investment, which he will now use to maybe pay school fees for his children that will last for three, four, five years. So the question then now is, should he still go ahead to make this investment, or should he preferably use the money to pay the school fees of his children, in terms of paying first year, second year, third year, and pay everything off to the money that the money can go? In terms of what kind of investment advice do you, have, do you give the, the, the public? So should they go ahead to invest? Is it better to withhold their investment? And maybe use it for something that they are sure of that they will get return on investment. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Franklin. Um, what I will start with is um, we all know that in times of crisis, you know, um, sometimes it might be better for you to, you know, tarry a while to understand what you're investing in. Uh, there's a, a, a phrase I used to tell my colleague when I was um, uh, an executive banking, that return of the money is more important than return on the money. So if I'm not sure what you're doing, better hold the capital than the, the interest. But having said that, um, the, before I, since I don't totally have a, a full picture of what kind of investment you had in mind to, to, to go into before, I can just talk around it. Now, the... Again, it depends on the duration of the school fees they're paying, and whether the school fees is in Naira or in foreign currency. Now, if you're paying a, a, a foreign currency uh, denominated school fees, I would have rather you pay it now at the rate you find. Because what has happened in the environment is um, with a uh, high um, significant drop in oil, crude, um, crude oil prices, foreign currency, um, um, foreign, forex, uh, income the country have dropped, which typically is 95% of the country's income. If oil prices have gone down from 90, so $60 to just under 20 now, you can do the math and know how far, you know, in terms of the availability of foreign currency will, happen, uh, will, will be in Nigeria. The Central Bank of, um, of Nigeria has adjusted the exchange recently uh, from what, 360 to 3, uh, 380. But if you look at the rate, the parallel market rate today, trending upward of um, 420 for the other. So we don't know which direction that will go. So if the investment, the school fees, coming back to the question, if the school fees that this gentleman has to pay is in foreign currency, I will advise you pay it now and avoid possible devaluation of uh, currency in the future because you, really, you can't gamble on that. I don't expect um, advise people to gamble on foreign currency. Even without the hedges in place, better you know where you stand. But one uh, 10 naira drop in the rate can wipe out the whole of that investment income. However, if it's a naira denominated school fees, perhaps you can. Now, if we, let me try back. If you go to the back in the three days, the interest rates are dropped to single digits, two percent, three percent, or whatever. 
So I didn't know the investment outlet. But if you have a medium term view uh, of return, you expect to pay that in maybe six months thereabouts. Maybe if, uh, um, if you are not um, totally averse to a uh, stock market, the, the stock prices today are down significantly. You might you know, go into the stock market. But like I said, there are some parts of this decision that are not open. We don't know when the school fee is, the, the, the time life of the payment of the school fee, the, the risk appetite of the gent, the, the person that asked the question, et cetera. These are what would have guided, you know, in, in, you know creating, um, giving a valuable advice in terms of what decision to make. But the important thing today, I would still say, when you are making such investment, just be conscious of the fact that you know where you're going to, where you're taking your money to. Like I would say, return of the money, which is the capital or principal, should take precedent over the return on the money, which is interest. I think, maybe I think, I hope I've answered the question. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. And that takes me back to Professor Kennedy. There's a question that says that firms, including his own, they are planning to downsize because there is no production, no demand, inputs are not being supplied, everything is in decline. So how will firms manage job security for the employees in this period of COVID-19? Um, thank you very much for that question. I think that the uh, numerous businesses that are facing that now, but then it leads me to a point which I think is necessary for survival of all businesses, um, with or without COVID-19, which is the question of innovation. And I think that in that regard, we have seen things happen across uh, various countries of Africa in which people are innovating and doing things different from what it was that their core business is on account of this risk there. I think that the problem that the person faces is not uh, a peculiar one. For a number of us, we've had to look at cash flows going forward and then determine how long can we afford to pay this while putting on our thinking hats and say what is required in this environment. Now, there are a couple of sectors, and I think that Henrietta alluded to those when she spoke, that if you like, maybe experiencing a boom in this instance. But I think the one which we may not have uh, perhaps adequately uh, dealt with, maybe in terms of technology. You know, so we did, somebody asked a specific question with, response, uh, with regard to technology from the banking sector uh, as, as well. But we find that technology is pouring innovation across things. We have seen that if that person, the person asking this question, is a business that does not require the physical presence, but whereas before your means of distribution or delivery was by face-to-face -face means, can you consider now whether any of those can be done using electronic uh, uh, means as well? One of the things that we have seen is that there's some that you cannot move electronically. For instance, in the hospitality or leisure industry with hotels and things, we cannot move those electronically as well. But then what is it that your company was doing before that you may be able to uh, do electronically now? And then what else? What skills exist within your company you can do? It was interesting that I've come across a number of things lately. For instance, uh, we had on the micro and the techno, the innovations that I speak about don't necessarily have to be high tech. They could also be low tech as well. So we find that with people who have been operating, if you like, at, amongst the lower ends there, some of them have set up at the very, it's innovation, but at the lower end there, places in which people can have sanit, um, sanitizers and hand washing facilities with soap being squirted out there. In Ghana, I saw someone create something out of a drum that has, you know, you put your hand under, it dispenses soap and water, you put at a fraction of the cost. Yes, nobody has any money right now. Is there a way we, by which we can get a coalition of the various players in the private sector or the government to support this initiative, given that in the absence of adequate social distancing, as a sales, a large economy so with a huge population such as Nigeria, our recourse is to sanitation. That is an um, example as well there. So we may look at how we can move our, our businesses online using technology or how we can innovate in various respects in order to deal with that there. But there is a fair chance that for some industries, none of this can happen. I think Harrietta spoke about airline industry. You cannot move flights online, for example. It may be hard for the stewardesses to say, what else can they do in the absence of the hospitality industry? And unfortunately, that is a sad reality that is a consequence of the COVID-19 situation. Thank you very much, Enaxia. Let me take, take it to 
uh, Professor Ogwechia. He said, as risks take a more prominent position in the sustainable growth and performance of firms, do you think that it will change the way African firms are managed and governed? And will it require a rejigging of the board and governance structure of African firms? Thank you, Franklin. Uh, first and foremost, with the current situation, the boards of African companies have to change for three reasons. Reason number one, management will require, we need guidance from the board to help them navigate this turbulent environment. The board must now be very much involved in risk management. How? By ensuring that they have the right processes, very robust enough to identify the risk appetite, the limits, and have policies in place, and make sure that these policies are adhered to. They have to allocate adequate, if not more, resources to internal control and risk issues. Second, the boards will now be made up of not people who know others and they are there for the citizen allowance and director's fee, but those who will bring in expertise to bear. Thirdly, the board will do more work. If on the average they spend 20 days a year, they now have to spend at least 40 days a year because the board will now have to be more handsome than they used to be because there's a need to help assist management navigate. It is not interfering in what management does, but being able to kickstart so many initiatives. I don't said, and most of us on this one have just said that innovation is critical. If innovation is not brought up up that board level, then we cannot get out of this. So innovation, risk management must be something that the boards must have a big picture. So the way boards are structured will be different. The fourth point is that boards will get smaller. This is not the time for large boards because of costs. Most companies in Africa will not be the hard way manage our costs. How do we bring costs down? Because revenue will not increase initially until we discover new markets. It's an opportunity for us to look at new markets, new ways of doing things, but serving different set of people now. So boards will be smaller. Because they're going to be smaller, there's a need to have the right people with the right skills there. And one of the most important skills that must be there on the board is risk management. The other skill that is critical is creative thinking, design thinking, innovation. These skills are critical for African companies to be able to get out of this turbulent environment successfully. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Sakris. Let me take it back to Hereta. And he says, from risk management perspective, what five key lessons can African businesses, particularly SMEs, learn from COVID-19? Five key lessons for especially SMEs that they can learn from COVID-19. Many SMEs. Yes, it's true, they have a lot of challenges between multiplicity of taxes, etc. But the point is, so many were panicking right from the first, I wouldn't even say the first one, the first week, and laying off staff. And um, the ideal thing would be for companies or SMEs during good times to save, have an allowance, maybe call it a hazard allowance, where they have some money that can help them tie through three to six months of a bad patch. Okay, so um, those who were not doing it before because they took it for granted that business will continue as usual will now understand the importance of this. Um, the other point is scenario planning. Okay, it's normal to plan for best case scenario, worst case scenario, and expected scenarios. So most times when things are going well, especially, it's almost like once I've prayed, you know, how we are in Nigeria with the, the, the prayer, everything will continue to go well for me. Okay, so now we've understood the importance of 
thinking about these scenarios, thinking it through with the board or the management, and really asking yourself what you will do. You know, cases like, so for example, the import dependent companies, what do they do now? Okay. Um, and then I would say the third would be communication and involvement. One of the things I've been telling people who have spoken to me is that laying off your staff will not ensure survival of your business. Okay, because perhaps if you had called them together and tried to discuss the way forward, ideas that you alone may not have had will come up regarding how you can continue. Because at the end of the day, if you lay off your staff and you continue trying to do business as usual, if you don't have customers in this new situation, the business will still, will still die. What you want is to survive. Okay, so, and for this to happen, you need ideas, innovation, and that comes more easily when you talk with your staff. It's also a time for you to build strong bonds with, with your staff members. Okay, we all talk about, complain about employee loyalty, but what, now is the time for us to show employer loyalty. Okay, so if you let them go just when they need you the most, that, I mean, there are two sides of the coin. One is that you may not still survive, and the other is that you're actually releasing a willing to work person into, um, into crime. Because at the end of the day, people who were struggling to survive before will not just sit down and die, especially since um, the palliatives are not getting to those who need it the most. They will try to find a way to survive and the, the, they may be compelled to go into crime. So we need to think through our decisions before we take action. And then um, the other thing I would also say is innovation. Okay, so if I can't continuously import, what can I, what, what, what are the local substitutes available? I think that this period is going to compel us to do a lot of things differently. Nigeria has um, gotten used to importing things like pencils, toilet paper, um, I don't know, things that we can easily manufacture, toothpicks. That is ridiculous. So time has come for us to begin to ask ourselves how we can begin to manufacture these things in-house. Okay? Um, our bar brothers, I'm sure, never did PPEs before, the personal protection equipment, but now they're doing it. They never did face masks before. Now they're doing it. So tailors need to begin to find ways to make themselves relevant. Okay, relevance is always key for survival and business sustainability. So how, really ask yourself the question, how can I key into the new economy? How can I be relevant now? Without doing that, it's going to be very difficult um, for you to survive just thinking about uh, money, money, money. Okay? So I think that this will be the um, suggestions I would give to um, business SMEs or even multinationals to one have greater communication with their staff in seek involvement to agree on the way forward to plan going forward for, a, for the rainy day also money aside three really key to relevance to see how you can be relevant Four, think about how you can um, get local substitutes for your inputs and you might just find like Nigerian breweries that the local found out that the lo local sorghum was actually superior to the malt they were importing. That you might even find better local substitutes that you haven't bothered to think about because we're used to um, uh, importing foreign goods. So a good example is wheat. Wheat flour is not as healthy as cassava flour or coconut flour or plantain flour. These are healthier um, local substitutes, but and they can be used to bake. But we have never experimented because it has always been easy to import wheat flour. So. This is time, time has come for us to begin to experiment and to put on our innovative hats. And remember, innovation doesn't have to be high tech always, it can be common sense at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carietta. Billy, there's a related question saying that we, everybody seems to be saying that IT will solve most of the problems. But there are sectors that don't rely on IT. And even in the health sector, there are aspects of health sector that will still require you to. Even with the advance of telemedicine, that they still require you to do a physical appearance or physical contact as the case may be. So this goes to okay. And the question is, are there new strategies you think that African firms can use for effective uh, risk management? And do you think that this risk digitization or using uh, technology to do everything is the way to go? And will this strategy be applicable to all firms and sectors, or will it be different for multinationals and SMEs? Uh, thank you. <clears throat> now, the, um, the COVID-19, as, um, as everybody has reiterated, should know that the risk uh, environment continues to change. I'm not sure anybody would have, uh, in any scenario planning, you know, anticipated a lockdown of cities, countries, for a month, going into two months in some instances. So, and that has also thrown in a whole lot more risk. 
So nobody can sit down and say he knows all the risk, um, possible risk that his, his, organization, his organization can, can face. Now, um, with that in mind, the, the option that I think from the which also mentioned the issue about uh, part of what organization will do to survive is be innovative, you know, as the environment change. And we also know that innovation brings in their own risks. That if not managed, it can, it can, be a, it can lead to a challenge for organization. So with all this uh, bit of known and unknown, I think that the, the option will be in the, um, devising or designing a risk management framework to align it with the objectives, visions, missions, strategy of organizations. In a, I mean, that, 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 that is to say that organizations need to um, implement enterprise-wide risk management frameworks that basically supports innovation um, you know, and changes the environment. You know, these changes can bring in opportunities or risks that need to be managed. We have a risk framework that is um, not agile. It may end up uh, stifling the organization from innovation, stopping people from thinking. So basically, um, an enterprise risk management framework that um, um, will be thought that it aligns uh, risk management with strategy and performance in the organization. Support performance, support risk taking, in a responsible manner. Um, so for African leader, I think um, um, designing an enterprise-wide risk management framework will ensure that they don't start with organizations to impede the realization of business objectives. I mean, we can all sit down and be talking risk, risk, risk. At the end of the day, money has to be made, and it's that money that we will pay for the risk management structure. So we cannot get risk management structure to start with business objectives. So basically, that will also require that the board and management at the at the which you said earlier on must be on top of their game. You know, the risk management, you can't um, just hire a risk expert and um, farm it out to him or her to do. The risk management, as we say, they must start with the uh, executive team because you are balancing the objectives of the business with responsible business practices to ensure that, like I said, you end up achieving the objectives of the business even when you are managing the risk that are, that are inherent. Now, um, I also recommend that, uh, um, as uh, Rita said earlier on, scenario planning is, um, I mean, most of what I use to SWOT analysis, your strengths, weaknesses, strengths, and uh, opportunities, etc. But every, the risk that we are seeing today shows that it can never, you know, through that process, it will never be prepared for um, the kind of thing we are seeing today. So scenario planning, is a, a risk framework that I, I would suggest that African businesses should, um, you know, um, imbibe to ensure that the organization will be in a, um, um, in a situation to respond when scenarios that, even if it's not, it doesn't come out the way you planned it. I mean, uh, the truth is nobody would have anticipated the kind of risk we are putting today. I mean, the last time I had this kind of issue was 1918, um, the so-called Spanish influenza. Okay, so that's what you can compare to what you have today. And while you cannot anticipate through any scenario planning, what, you know, the kind of risk on, um, that we are facing today, it's clear that the organization that has some form of planning from a risk management framework will come out, will likely come out better or be able to mitigate more of the risk inherent today than those that do not have any plan at all. Um, again, I would say um, in Nigeria, typically, uh, most African countries, uh, the mention of any possible ugly incident, we say, God forbid. God forbid, in that case, cannot be part of a risk management frame, structure or framework for an organization. You have to anticipate things, no matter how ugly they, look, they, they appear, and prepare. Even if you don't get it fully, it will be better than people who do not plan at all. Um, I don't know if I've been able, I hope I've been able to answer the question. Yes, thank you very much. Um, okay. And uh, we're, it's about five minutes past two now. So we're almost uh, uh, running out of time. But it, let me ask the one last question to uh, Enlase and Sakris. And it's, this one goes to Enlase. It said, to ensure more risk awareness and practice across African firms, are there things that government and regulators should do differently? Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, for that question. I think that in particular sectors, you already had the organizations that have, uh, as part of the regulations, require that the risk management framework be put in place. For instance, in the financial service 
uh, sector. Um, other regulators that govern other sectors of the economy may want to look to see whether there is a need. I think that there is a clear need for this to be insisted upon. However, there are specific changes that have been brought about that I think the regulators, government and relevant agencies should be able to look at. For example, I think that the Securities and Exchange Commission, Corporate Affairs, and perhaps the Stock Exchange may want to look at reviewing and amending existing regulatory frameworks that guide corporate organizations to accommodate and provide for the issues that are coming up, for instance, with relations to tax and deferring the tax that is due, given the situation of uh, uh, lowered uh, performance that, that we are expecting to see going forward there. I also think we've had a lot of instances in which we have seen the private sector coming out and contributing towards the palliatives of the government, perhaps through provision of uh, the necessary equipment and healthcare facilities, to also providing the provisions that are necessary for things. However, one of the greatest things that is facing a number of people now is about how do they manage their finances, be it organizations or be it individuals as well. As, well. as part of, if you like, their contribution to alleviating the challenges of this, could there be some uh, dedicated websites, for instance, that provide some training, some teaching to people on the, so that we can reach a multiple um, number of people as opposed to what each of us may be doing with silos as well. For small businesses, I think that the point has been rightfully made for the support that is needed, especially for those in the informal sector. We must be mindful of the fact that especially in a country like Nigeria, but true for most of Africa, 60 to 65% of our economy comes from the informal sector. These are people who cannot go out every day to earn a living. Is there any sort of support or safety net that the, regular, or the, the government can look to put in place other than providing them with uh, food there? If you like a bailout on the, on the smaller scale as well. Other things that can be put in place to enable regulators manage risk and things. I think that if we could see some policy pronouncements or incentives from governments that can enable businesses at this time move from business continuity to crisis uh, management, those will be very welcome then. So I will uh, stop my comments for now. Um, let Chris contribute as well. Thank you very much. And to uh, Sir Chris, the question is, that risk and strategy are believed to be two sides of the same coin. So what advice or suggestion do you have for African firms with regards to issues of strategy formulation and execution, given the, the COVID-19? The first advice is one, is to integrate risk into strategy and business model. The second advice is to key in from what OK already mentioned, that when you have disruptions like this, you need to now move into scenario planning. So strategy formulation can no longer be based on just one scenario. Strategy formulation must be based on different scenarios that come up, in three and four scenarios, because then you now have to track the various factors and the trends that could play out in each of those scenarios. So for each scenario is to develop a strategy. So if this scenario plays out, how do I, how do I respond? If the next one plays, how do I respond? So if that way, we can then actually integrate risk into uh, strategy and business model. But the second aspect of it, when it comes to execution, is a commitment to ethical principles. Because if we, one of the biggest issues in terms of strategy execution is non-adherence to ethical principle, because then we do things the way we want to do, and at the end of the day, we take the wrong decision. So adherence to ethical principles could be a strong way of ensuring that structure is executed properly. The second aspect of it is again, adhering to responsible business practices. This is not the time to cut corners. This is not the time to do things as usual that this is Nigeria, Nigeria is different, Nigeria is peculiar, this is Nigerian way. Or this is Africa, we have to do things the African way. This is the time for us to say, what will work in our environment? How can we make it work? So those issues are very critical. The other is that we have to ensure that we have the right skill sets because execution is about people. If you don't have the right people, you cannot execute even the best strategy. But the right skill sets should also 
come along with the right mindset. These two play. Do we have the right skill sets? Do we have the right mindset? Because all that ensures that we have the right culture of executing our strategy effectively. This is my, this is my simple message to African countries, African companies. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Chris, and to all the other panel members. It's, uh, we only have about three minutes to conclude. We have 350 questions that we've tried to answer some of them. And of course, it will be difficult to answer 350 questions in an hour, 15 minutes. However, let me point out that we're just discussing or we are, we've been, um, when I say, shocked with the way COVID-19 is uh, spreading, the impact and all that. But it's important that as we go along, that we appreciate that COVID-19 is just one of the mentioned or identified global risk that we have to deal with. So from all we've heard this afternoon, it's clear that we have to rethink our strategy. We need to appreciate the importance of the link between strategy and risk management. We also need to appreciate human resources, being the greatest asset we have in terms of effective management of our risk. We also have to rethink innovation, having resilience, and also in terms of having business continuity plan. And all these factors will help us to have a more robust understanding of risk and also to develop a more sustainable and effective strategy that will help us. So in addition to COVID-19, the other in 2018, 2019, the World Economic Forum did a research and published what they call the top 10 global risk. And uh, spread of infectious disease is actually the seventh in terms of impact. So we have six other global risks that can actually cause higher impacts, that's negative impact than COVID-19, and include failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation, weapons of mass destruction, water crisis, large-scale involuntary migration, energy price shock, biodiversity and ecosystem collapse, physical crisis. Other risks that we have to bear in mind is data fraud and theft and cyber attacks asset bubble, and profound social instability. So all these risks, in addition to the ones we know, like regulatory, credit, market, operational, legal, and all that. So you can see that the list seems to be endless. So what it requires then is that our CEOs, our management, need to put on their thinking cap, appreciate that it is a challenging period, but within the challenging period also, there are rooms for effective innovation, good strategy that will help them to remain sustainable. So on this note, I will advise that what we need to do, as I emphasized earlier on, is to be clear with your strategy, to rethink your strategy, to understand the importance of business continuity planning. The research carried out showed that only 57% of companies actually have a prepared business continuity plan. Most companies don't have. Most CEOs don't even understand or appreciate the importance of business continuity and management plan. Most companies don't do scenario planning, and most companies do not involve their HR in their strategic planning. Because if we say that talents or human resources are the most important asset that we have, it means that the HR unit must be involved in every decision-making process to understand the vision and strategy of the firm, to be able to recruit the right people that aligns with the vision and strategy of the organization. So on this note, of course, we are still, we're open for further consultation. We will, uh, the, uh, what we've heard today will be recorded and posted, and we are very happy to continue the discussion and the engagement in any way you want us to help you. So let me, on this note, thank all our panel members, starting from Enase Otenedo, Chris Obechia, Okeonwuke, and Renta Onwebuzia, and my humble self, Franklin. It's been a, an interesting session, and I, I hope and believe that it's been helpful. Thank you again, and stay safe, stay healthy, and be happy. Thank you. <laughs>